Good morning. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. Bethany, glad to have you with us uh, here this morning. If you've been around Bethany for a while, you've heard the phrase, disciples making disciples. And we just want to keep that phrase in front of everybody. Bethany Church is about that, disciples making disciples. A disciple is a student, it's a learner, it's a follower of Jesus. And so we want to help you become a disciple, to know and to love Jesus, and to grow in such a way that you can actually go and help other people become disciples as well. That's our, that's our goal, that's our purpose here as Bethany Church. So um, a handful of weeks ago, we, uh, we sat down as the pastors to kind of lay out the preaching schedule, and so we decided that Pastor Dirk was going to do this series in January that he's just finished up called One Nation Under God, and then i do this in between week, and then Pastor Bruce would start our next series the following week. The great thing about having a sermon that's not within a sermon series is you can talk about whatever you want to. The hard thing about not being in a sermon series is you can talk about whatever you want to. So you sit down with the Bible and you're like, okay, well, I've got a topic. It's called the scripture. Where do I go from here? And so I just spent time thinking and praying and really, uh, you know, reflecting on where scripture has been speaking into my life, how it's impacted me. And I landed where we're going to go today is Psalm 19. I've been spending time over the past really months going out to the ocean and just sitting there uh, reading through Psalm 19. There were some days I would read one verse and just kind of sit and pray and meditate on that one verse. So this psalm has become really impactful to me over the past handful of months, and my prayer is that it would do that for you. It would impact you in a significant way um, as you hopefully come to love it like I love it. And even more so that we don't just see the psalm or the scripture, but we see the one behind it, the one who wrote it and wants to communicate to us through it. That's God. So to that end, let's, uh, let's open our time up in a word of prayer. God, it feels a little bit strange to say we come here this morning expecting something from you, but we only do that because you asked us to gather and to worship and to expect that you would meet us, that you would communicate to us through your people, through your word, through the music. So we place our expectations before you and say, God, would you do that? Would you meet us? Don't just give us an inspiring word, but give us a transforming word from your scripture. Our prayer is that we're different people because we were here today with other people and that we met with you. Um, I know that throughout the weeks, um, people I'm sure have been gone through great highs and amazing lows. Thank you for this time that we can put aside just to be here. And we pray that you'd give us clarity of thought, you'd open our hearts and our minds to what you want to say, and that you would instruct us in a new way. And we would leave here loving you and loving others more because of this time. That is our desire, God. We can't force it, but we know you love to answer those types of prayers. So we look forward to what you're going to do, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start um, by sharing something that I think will put us on common ground as we dig into this scripture together. And that starting point is actually a song from years ago by a, an artist named Chris Rice. Chris Rice wrote this song called Big Enough. And in the song, he's asking questions of God. He's asking questions about why this and not this. I'm not sure I understand, God, what you would ordain things this way and not another way. And when you get to the chorus, listen to these words that he says in the chorus. He says, God, if you're there, I wish you'd show me. And God, if you care, then I need you to know me. And I hope you don't mind me asking the questions, but I figure you're big enough. I figure you're big enough. And he goes on and sings another verse about the questions that he has. And I love that song and that chorus because I feel like it puts us on even ground to say we all, at some point in our life, have asked that question or wrestled with that question, God, are you there? And I think it's powerful because it's not just for the person who identifies as a follower of Christ, but someone who's in the process of figuring out who is God. All of us have reached a point where we're saying, God, are you there? Are you listening? I'm trying to talk to you. Would you speak back to me? And that really digs to the deeper question that I want to ask us and have us think about this morning is, does God speak? Does God speak? And if he does, how do we hear him? How do we know if he's actually communicating with us? Does God speak is that core question. Maybe you've been like me that through your, your walk, if you're a follower of Christ, you've experienced the seasons where there are times when you say you are just so close, you're walking in such intimacy with God that you know he speaks and you're hearing him and you're engaging with him in that dynamic and personal relationship. And then there's seasons where you're walking around saying, I don't know what's happening. The frequencies are not matching up, and I, I feel like I'm not hearing from God the way 
I want to. I think this psalm will point us in a direction to give us some clarity on answering that question, does God speak? And not just that, yes, he does, but the ways in which he's actually chosen to speak. Now, as we, as we jump in here, I want to lay two kind of foundation stones for us to think about. The first one is just an admonition, and I'll tell you, this is from my heart, and it's probably your experience, true to some degree. I wish that God would just speak to me like I speak to my friends and my family and how they speak back to me. Like I would just say to God, God, here's my question, and an audible voice would come back, and God would say, well, here's your answer. That would just be, make things really easy for me, right? But God works in mysterious ways. Think about the fact that Jesus says to his disciples at one point, he says, it's better that I go so the Holy Spirit will come. Now, again, confession. If I'm sitting there with Jesus, I'm like, I don't know this Holy Spirit, but I know you. And we've spent some time together, and we've been close, and you're going to disappear, and it's better that you're not here. I don't understand that. But in the same way, God has ordained it that the way he speaks may not be exactly how you and I speak to one another with this audible voice back and forth. But he made the universe. He ordains everything, and he is a good God who wants to let himself be known to all people. So at some point, I just need to bow my knee and say, God, you're in charge of the universe. You made everything, and the way that you see best to communicate to me and to us as humanity, I have to submit to that. And if I really think that he's a good father, then he's going to communicate in a way that I can hear. He is not a God who is distant and doesn't want to speak. Francis Schaeffer wrote this book, The God Who Is There. God is not silent. That's God communicating to us. What does that actually look like? Okay, so God sets the terms of what our communication with him looks like. The second thing is that we realize just in our day-to-day life that there are many ways in which we communicate. Think about this phrase you may have said or heard before. Your presence there just made all the difference in the world. Your presence there spoke volumes. Have you ever been in a meeting when you're waiting on someone else to show up and the people in the meeting are already starting the discussion and then that last person walks in? Even just the presence of that person walking in the room can shift the whole dynamic. They don't have to walk in and say, I'm here, now the meeting can start or let's change the topic. Just the person being there can change the dynamic. Just presence can communicate. We communicate in lots of different ways. My wife, every day, when my daughter takes lunch to school, just writes her a note and sticks it in her lunchbox. So she writes her a note, and every day she's communicating with someone who she's not in the same room with. Presence can communicate. Just writing a note can communicate. How about this? Have you ever seen a look communicate something to you? I was sharing with the first service that I've been blessed with a wife who is able to help and guide me in moments where we're in social settings, and I'm speaking outside the bounds of which I should speak. You know, you start to tell a joke or share a story that maybe shouldn't be shared, And she doesn't have to interrupt and say, please don't say that. That might embarrass all of us, including the person to whom you're speaking. She just looks at me and goes, (laughs) right? And it communicates that information you're about to share is not what should be shared. And I say, you know, I'll have another Coke, you know, just change the topic. So even a look can communicate. We know that communication happens through this audible voice, through listening and speaking, but it also happens in other ways. And we're going to see, I think, two particular ways from this psalm that God has chosen to communicate. So what we're going to do is open up. You can look in your bulletins there if you want to read along in your Bible or on your phone, however you want to do it. Psalm 19. We're going to look at the first two verses as we jump in here. Psalm 19, to the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. The heavens declare the glory of God. Listen to these words in the first two verses. Declare, proclaim, pours out, reveals. Those are not tepid words. It doesn't hint or imply at something. The scripture speaks boldly about the heavens communicating something very strongly. And the heavens, according to this passage, are declaring the glory of God. Now, if you've been in the church world for a while, glory is one of those words that we may use, but do we even know what we're talking about? Hallelujah, Hosanna. We might sing those words, but do we have a clue what they even really mean? Glory is a very common word in the scripture and in church circles, but what does glory actually mean? Well, ask theologians, and they'll tell you, well, it's hard to give you a single definition because it's so all-encompassing of who God is. 
The best definition I've heard of the word glory was given by John Piper when he said, glory is God's holiness gone public. Glory is God's holiness gone public. Literally, the awesomeness of God in some form of display. God takes who he is, the fact that he is set apart, totally different than all things, than all of creation, and he reveals that in some way, and that is his glory. And this scripture says that the heavens communicate to you and me that God is speaking about who he is, and when we look to the heavens, we should say, there is one who is totally different and totally set apart who has created this. The next verse says, or the next part of that verse, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Not only is he glorious, totally different, totally set apart, but he is a creator and a masterful one at that. Those are strong words. They don't imply. They declare God is saying something through the heavens. And I think it's fair to say, as you read through the rest of this passage, that he communicates through all of the created world. But in particular, this passage speaks about the heavens, the firmaments, the sky, telling us something about who God is. There is no speech nor are there any words whose voice is not heard. He's speaking, but he's speaking silently in some way. You know, I reflected on this psalm, and I thought to myself, we could go right to the place of modern technology and say, okay, what do we know about outer space and universes and galaxies? And that's all good and helpful. But what about the person who wrote this psalm? Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, somebody sat down and said, inspired by God, the heavens declare who God is and his gloriousness and his creative capacity. So what would it look like to go back to that place and think, what were they experiencing that they said this, they learned this, they understood it? Let me share an experience with you from my life. When I was in college, I took a trip to upstate New York to the Adirondack State Park. It was a solo trip. It was in the early spring, so there was still a lot of snow on the ground. And I drove up, and I got into the parking lot and started to hike up. And as I was hiking up to the summit of this mountain called Big Slide Mountain, I had to first cross over these three smaller mountains called the Three Brothers. And so I stopped on the first brother. When night fell, I took out my sleeping bag, and I laid it down, and I made my dinner, and I ate, and then I climbed into my sleeping bag. And as the sun disappeared and I laid on this open rock just staring at the skies, the heavens declared the glory of God. And your eyes start to strain because as you're looking, you're trying to take in a specific star and then you just see there everywhere. And there's no ambient light and then it just starts to fill the sky more and more and more. It becomes so challenging to even pick out a constellation because there's so many stars in the sky. I was reflecting back when Abraham and Genesis 15 is told by God, step out of your tent and look at the stars in the sky. Count them, Abraham. And Abraham says, I can't do that. He says, this is what your offspring will be like. The heavens declare the glory of God. Take a moment at some point in the next week and just in the darkness stand and look at the night sky and you will feel infinitely small in light of the infinite creator. And so as I was laying there, my eyes started to get tired, and my mind is saying, go to sleep, but my heart is saying, no, stay awake and keep staring. And then from one side of my field of vision, this star kind of exploded into light and then traveled across the entire sky and then faded into the distance. And as I lay there with this stupid grin on my face, I thought to myself, the heavens declare the glory of God. The nighttime declares the glory of God, but even Additionally to that, the daytime declares the glory of God because the next morning I woke up to what felt like a flashlight in my face. And it was, it was just God's flashlight. It's called the sun. I was about 20 miles away over a giant mountain comes the sunrise. And I wake up to that saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. If our question is, does God speak the scripture and probably your experience and mine would say, yes, he speaks the heavens are communicating boldly and loudly and clearly about who God is. So you may hear that and say, okay, yeah, I've had that experience. I've been up on those, you know, out in the dark and and looking at the stars and kind of blown away by the grandness. So that's maybe what the psalmist felt, just through his five senses, taking in the grandness of God through creation, through the heavens. Let's take it to modern day. Let me give you some interesting facts that I found out about, um, about our universe. Jupiter's icy moon Europa reportedly has an active ocean beneath its surface. 
Jupiter has an ocean that you and I will never see. But God ordained to say, I want an ocean on that planet. Here's another one for you. Jupiter's fourth largest moon has over 400 active volcanoes. Okay, maybe you're into looking at the stars and studying the planets. I didn't know that Jupiter had volcanoes. I didn't know Jupiter had moons. And according to this research, it says Jupiter's fourth largest moon, which means that there's three moons that are bigger than that one, and there's probably additional moons after that, and they have volcanoes on the moon that are active and exploding. How about this one? Titan, one of Saturn's many moons, has lakes, rivers, and oceans of liquid ethane, methane, and propane. If you want to see gas prices drop, <laughs> all we have to do is start tapping into what's happening out on just one of Saturn's many moons. Mount Olympus on Mars is the biggest mountain in our solar system and measures three times the size of Mount Everest. The heavens, more and more as we understand the universe, declare, they cry out, they scream that there is a God who is glorious. Now, you may hear these facts and say, that's interesting. Maybe your mind is not fully blown at this point. Well, if you feel that way, I want to share a short video with you that I think will take you to an amazing level of seeing the grandeur of God. Let's watch this together. What, what you're seeing right now. First of all, this is the earth, okay? That is just, just you're taking off from the earth from Southern California, and we're going we're gonna to rise up for a little bit here, okay? We're going to pull away from it. We're going to pull higher. Now, this is at about 10 kilometers like if you climb Mount Everest, this is what you'd see. You'd see the curvature of the earth from that distance. Now you're gonna, we're gonna climb up even higher. This is at 100 kilometers. And you're a fourth of the way to the space station now. This is what you'd see. If you get to this level, you're considered an astronaut. Just if you ever get there. Okay, now we're going 100,000 kilometers. 100,000 kilometers from the earth. So you're a fourth of the way to the moon. That's what the earth would look like. Now we're going to pull away to a million kilometers. At a million kilometers, there's the moon. Okay? There's the moon. You can barely see the Earth. You're at a million kilometers now. You're past the, past the moon. And uh, now we're going to go to 100 million kilometers. 100 million kilometers. You're still not to the sun. The sun's 93 million miles away. But now we're going to go to 10 trillion kilometers. Ten, there's the sun. Okay. You just passed the sun. Now you would see all of the planets at 10 trillion kilometers. And now we're at 10 to the 15th power. That means 10 with 15 zeros. I don't know what that number is. 15 zeros. And the sun's just like a bright dot amidst other stars. And now we're going to 10 light years away. At 10 light years away. Come on, let's go. Zoom. There you go. 10 light years away. Now you just see the sun with like 11 other stars that are kind of its neighbors. You know, that, 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 that's our sun. And now we're going to go 1,000 light years away. At 1,000 light years away, you, you wouldn't even see our sun anymore. These are just a bunch of stars close to it in this cluster inside the Milky Way. Now we're going to zoom out even further, and that's the Milky Way we live in. See that cluster of stars? Those are about 100,000 stars that are closest to our sun. You can't see our sun anymore at this point. Now this is our Milky Way galaxy, and forget about the Earth. Okay, there's our Milky Way galaxy that we live in, um, and we're just buried in there somewhere. And we're going to pull out even further, and you'll see that our galaxy is actually, it's, it's a big galaxy, and, uh, and all those other things you're seeing now are galaxies. And we're going to pull away 10 million light years now. His next scene is 10 million light years. Those are all galaxies you see amidst our Milky Way, several hundred galaxies. Now we're going to go 100 million light years away. This is the last one. We're going to zoom out to 100 million light years. Those are all clusters of galaxies. Galaxies and clusters of galaxies. You won't even see our Milky Way galaxy anymore amidst that. And he holds it all in the palm of his hand. People asked after the first service, if you want to look it up, you can just get on YouTube. It's called The Awe Factor. You can watch it again and again and again and be, be amazed. We're only barely two verses in. Let's continue on, get a little further into this. There is no speech nor other words whose voice 
is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. I love those two verses because it's as if the psalmist is expecting somebody to be skeptical and say, you say the creation or that the heavens are speaking, I don't hear it. And the psalmist basically says, they don't have to use words, just open your eyes. Creation and through creation, God is speaking. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The picture here given is of a, a bridegroom, a groom coming out of his chambers and not kind of stumbling out, but coming out with a sense of boldness in the same way that you see a runner not kind of limping through the race, but running with joy this race set before him. The sun comes out every morning, travels its course and disappears and then does the same thing again and again and again. And there's nothing that the sun does not in some way touch. The heavens declare the glory of God. Does God speak? Absolutely. He speaks through what he's created. If you're a note taker, you can jot down Romans 1 because I'm convinced that Paul referred back to this when he talks about in Romans 1 how creation declares about who God is, his nature, and what he's actually like. So if the heavens are one way which God communicates, it's interesting that the psalmist turns a corner here at this point. He's talking about the created world, and then he says in verse 7, watch this, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God speaks through creation, and then the psalmist turns a corner and says, but God also speaks through his law. Now, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, when I hear law, it makes me a little bit nervous. You can jump quickly to that place of saying, here are God's restrictions, here are God's limit, because in my experience on planet Earth, and maybe you're holier than me and you don't have this issue, but for me, when I'm driving down the road and I see a police officer and then I pass him and the police officer pulls out behind me, my gut reaction is never, I am so much safer now. <laughs> That's not what I think. If I'm by myself, I think, what did I do? And then I'm doing four miles an hour in the 30 mile an hour range, right? Or if my wife's sitting next to me, as soon as she sees the police officer pull over, she does this one to check the speedometer, right? So law has this kind of constricting, it's going to control me, it's going to say I can't do this or I should be doing this and not that feeling to it. But just listen to how the law is described. As God speaks through the law, listen to how it's described here. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. I just, I took a moment and I jotted down the words there that kind of jump out to us when we read through the law and the words that he used to actually describe the law. Listen to this list. Perfect, reviving, sure, making wise, right, rejoicing, pure, enlightening, clean, enduring, righteous, true, gold, sweet, great reward. Do those sound like words to you of a God communicating and saying, stop doing that, that's naughty? Or is he saying, I want to give you life and there is life in my word? Again, how we perceive God makes a huge impact on this. If I think he's begrudging, that's totally different than what this describes. Life-giving overflowing, restoring my soul. That first verse in that section. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. I don't know about you, but for me, I need my soul to be revived every day. And as I go to his word, I find that that happens. The world in which we live is a broken, broken place. And if I look around to others for my source of comfort and hope and direction, I will eternally be disappointed because I'm looking at broken people as I'm a broken person saying, hey, can you make it better? But this says that the law of the Lord is perfect and that law will revive my soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's word, and particularly when we're talking about the law here, it's the earlier parts of the Bible, the law is to give life. 
We could so easily read you know, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and start saying there's all these rules and regulations and God just wants to make sure that they're following every single one. He's kind of a begrudging master. But spend some time at some point and read through those laws and all of a sudden you see, again, they are life-giving. If you're in the camp of the people of Israel and you have a skin disease and the law says you need to leave the camp, it's not because God wants to shun you. It's he says, I don't want that to spread to everybody else. Today we call that quarantine. It's a good medical practice. It's not God saying, I'm mad at you. It's God saying, for the good of all the people, go out and heal and then come back in. I was joking around about the topic of Leviticus with the staff the other day. If you look at the list of things that God says you can and can't eat, my personal favorite is the monitor lizard. You are not to eat the monitor lizard. A monitor lizard is like a small Komodo dragon, which is a massive, massive lizard. The Komodo dragon, as researchers continue to study it, has this disgusting saliva that's always falling out of its mouth. And when the dragon bites its prey like a deer or something like that, the deer becomes infected and eventually the dragon can consume the deer. And God's saying, hey, the little brother to that animal, don't eat that one. Now, if my response is, you are always telling me what to do. You are so bossy. I'm missing out on the fact that God's saying, that might kill you, so avoid the monitor lizard. Again, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's reviving the soul, and it's to guide us into good things. Look at that verse 10. To be more desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Have you ever eaten something that is so sweet that you don't just taste it and go that sweet, but you feel like your taste buds physically respond? You know, you're, you put that thing in your mouth and you go like, oh, I like my, my face feels how sweet that is. It's so sweet that your body responds. This says that the scripture is to be desired like that, like the drippings from a honeycomb. We're to want that from God's word. Is God speaking? Does God speak? Yes, he does. He has. He speaks through creation and he speaks through his law. The culmination of God speaking could best be described like this. From Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. This psalm speaks of creation communicating with us. This psalm speaks of the law communicating with us. And the culmination of God speaking is in his revelation of Jesus the one who was at creation, and the one who John calls the Word. God is speaking. He's talking to us in a variety of ways. And his ultimate form of communication was that he looked to earth and said, in the mess they're in, they cannot climb out of the sin that they have steeped themselves in. And so I will send my son for every single one of those people to live the life they should have lived and to die the death they should have died. God is speaking in a variety of ways, and ultimately in the person of Jesus. What he did in his life, his death, and his resurrection speaks that God wants us to be reconciled and made right with him. God is speaking. So let's turn the final stretch here. What do we do? How do we think about this? What's our response to this to be? Well, I'll tell you, my, my sense is that the reason we, and I'll put myself in this category, too, the reason we don't hear God as often as we want to is because we choose to be too busy. And I want to be specific with that language, not that we are too busy, but that we choose to be too busy. We let a million things flood out the most important thing. And I can remember conversations I've had with God saying, well, God, how come you're not showing yourself or revealing yourself to me? And I just feel like into my mind, my heart, he gives me that sense of, tell me about our relationship. And if you talk to me X number of times and you did that same thing with your wife, how would your relationship be with her? And then all of a sudden you see, well, if I'm not talking to him, then am I probably going to be able to hear from him? We choose to be busy with a million things instead of that most important thing. And when we reset ourselves to be focused on him, to listen, and to hear, then all of a sudden, now my relationship with God is growing and it becomes dynamic and more beautiful the way he intends it 
to actually be. My, my sense is that probably for most of us, the issue today is not we're going to leave and say, should I spend time reading my Bible or should I go rob that bank that I plan to do? We're not choosing the bad over the good in a lot of cases. Certainly that happens. But my sense is more often we choose the good instead of choosing the best. And so part of our discipline is just to learn to say, I need to learn to say no to the good so I can say yes to the best. And there is nothing better than God. We were made for communion and relationship with him. And so that is the best. Let's look at the final verses from this psalm. Verse 11, moreover, moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from my hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As the psalmist close out, closes out this psalm, he turns the final corner and basically says, you do speak. You speak through the heavens declaring your glory. You do speak. You speak through your law. And now his response is, in light of the fact that you have spoken, am I listening? Am I listening to what you said such that it's changing me so I might be this type of person? I would not be engaged in presumptuous sin. I wouldn't walk away and wander from your law. And that last verse, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O rock, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God, let the words that come out of my mouth and even the things that I'm thinking about in my heart be a reflection of the fact that I have heard you speak and I'm responding to the fact that I've heard you speak. God is speaking. He speaks through creation. He speaks through the heavens. God is speaking. He speaks through the law. As we read the scripture, God is speaking. He's spoken to us through Jesus. And then the question has to be, if he is clearly speaking, are we listening so that we can respond to enter into this fullness of life he desires for us here and then into eternal life with him? May God give us the grace to look, to listen, and then as he speaks, to respond. Let's pray. God, I just I confess to my brothers and sisters here that just being in the full-time vocational ministry world doesn't pull away this reality of being too busy or being caught up in too many things. Pastors, leaders, teachers in the church, we can become so busy doing good things that we miss out on the most important things. So for all of us, God, wherever we are, give us clarity, speak to us, let us hear the things that we need to change so that we might see and hear you as you speak. Because your word has transforming power in our lives if we're willing to receive it and respond to it. God, there is this unknowable, dynamic, unexplainable dance between the way you are sovereign over all things and yet let you, you engage with us in the process of our own change and transformation. Whatever our role is, God, help us to respond. Open our eyes, open our ears, so that we can be different people because we have heard from you, not just today, but every day going forward. Thank you that you speak. Change us by the power of your words as you communicate with us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.